they ask everybody to wear a tuxedo. I think everybody should wear a jalaba. <laughs> in fact, I was in Egypt years ago, and I was wearing a jalaba, and they didn't want to let me sit in the restaurant. And I said, you let people sit here that are wearing shorts and thongs, but you won't let a man bring a jalaba, which is indigenous to this country, sit here. And then the guy found out I was famous. He said, you can, you can come in. I said, no thanks. Anyway, it kind of took the spark out of wanting to sit there. But I, I love Egypt. It was a beautiful country. I mean, I love Morocco. People are great here. You feel comfortable here? Very. Because? Well, um, there's some uh, uh, Moroccan men who lives with us in New York also. I mean, just warm, beautiful people. I like it here. Well, glad to have you here in Morocco. My name is Kapekidos. I work for a Moroccan magazine called Mr. Morocco. So after Venice, you are presenting your last movie here at the Open in the Market Festival. So what's your feeling presenting the movie here, and um, what makes uh, Marrakech different from the other festivals? Wow. Um, well, let me ask you a question. I, I can, what do we want to talk about? Here. Do we want to talk about the movie? Do no, we want to talk everything. about my pajamas? Do we want to talk <laughs> about... <laughs> okay, I mean, I think we should try to talk about what the movie is, since that's something. Uh, just as far as being here, uh, I've been here. Um, we showed the movie in Venice, um, and that was a great experience. And then uh, the movie opened in the United States on November 16th. And so been doing a lot of talking about this movie. I guess it's better when people are interested than they're not interested. So, but, you know, uh, Laurence Olivier said that he acted for free. They paid him to do the press. <laughs> <laughs> and when you're doing this, you know, uh, like Van Gogh, I mean, in a sense, he wanted to paint. His pleasure wasn't in, in, in I mean, people always talk about the notion of agreement with others, that he didn't have success in his life. But what is success? I think success is doing what you want to do. And when you look, and if you do something and make something out of nothing, and then you look at it and you think, I'm satisfied with that, I'd say that that's success. And everything else is everything else. I mean, I can talk to you about the movie, but me talking about it is not the same thing as the film. So when people tell you their reasons for doing something, they're always lying to you because the thing is the thing and the reasons are the reasons. So they're not exactly the same. Um, there was an art historian named Leo Steinberg who said that uh, the art comes from the horse's mouth. The artist is just the horse. So that being said, um, I thought it was a great opportunity to come here and just um, but it, in, in a sense, it was um, not something that was um, to further a careerist kind of opportunity or, you know, I don't know what's happening in terms of the marketing of this movie or, or doing it for that reason. I think we did it to come to Morocco and, and be here and, and take a break for a little bit. And it was a great honor and you can, I actually thought you could sit down with some friends and watch the movie and enjoy it. I mean, I, a lot of directors will come and they go have dinner during their movie. But I don't really see it as a job and wanted to see how it felt to watch it with the people. And I like to watch the movie with the people. Unfortunately, there was a woman sitting next to me texting on her cell phone the whole time through the movie and it was an unbearable experience and I did not enjoy it. And I think that they should tell people that they have to turn their phones off or take their phones away before they go in, put them in a locker, and give them back at the end, because people are addicted to this now, and you, it's, it's, the manners are terrible. But this it's is connected to the debate nowadays about watching films at home or in a cinema. How, how is, what's your position in this? I mean, I think that, isn't it, have you seen the movie? Yes. 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 You saw it on a screen, yes? Yes. Wasn't it nice to say, how could you watch the movie on television? I mean, you can, but it, to sit in a movie theater on a big screen is how it was made. Have you seen the movie Roma? Yes. You really want to see that on a big screen. Uh, it's great that Netflix is going to distribute the movie, but they still 
more people will see it. But they're facing many problems with that. Yeah, but at the same time, uh, they have screenings. There have been many screenings in the United States, and Alfonso is at a lot of them too. And uh, but to see the movie on a big screen, vale la pena. You know? I mean, mm -hmm. and also for me. Um, <clears throat> I like to go to the movies and see a movie on a big screen. Do I like to have people, uh, uh, you know, you don't want to be a fascist about, you want to let everybody do what they want to do, but it, I think that there ought to be some kind of etiquette, uh, particularly at a film festival, the opening night of something. I don't I think that was totally uncool for these people. I, I should. I said, if you turn off your phone, maybe you see the movie. Said, Did you say that to her? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And she turned it off for me, and then she uh, started doing it again. I want to say, if you guys want to leave, it's fine, you know. But uh, have we ever met before? You look yes, so yes, familiar. Yes, 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 yes. Where do you live in Australia? I live in Paris, darling. Ah. <laughs> and and uh, I just saw your exhibition at Orsay. Oh, thank you. And I have been, I've got all the stuff from Venice on your film, actually. And I'm wonderful. I love you, I live in Paris, darling. Excuse me, I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, what do you think? Can I, but, but can I just ask, what, what yeah, yeah. did it mean for you to be the first artist to be invited to do this? Um, you know, that's a great deal. It is. is she, everybody know what she's talking about? Or yeah, I have a show at the Musée d'Orsay where I was able to select uh, paintings from the collection and show paintings of mine with those. So there's 10 paintings of mine from 1978 till last year. And there's um, Van Gogh's self portrait. Um, two Cezanne paintings that he made in his late 20s, early 30s, and uh, uh, Toulouse de Trek's two largest paintings that are uh, where he took the canvas and he glued the paintings together so you see all of these different seams and they're done very, very quickly and they, uh, um, there's a beautiful Manet painting and um, Gauguin's painting of the Alifant, which is the yellow tree that is in the film. So somebody says to me, are you happy? said I have to be pretty fucking stupid not to be happy. Uh, it was great, that's the first time they asked a living painter to do something like that. And um, it was great because I had a connection. I didn't, it wasn't, it was done kind of spontaneously. I was just walking through the collection, looking at the paintings, talking about them to the director and to Donacion Grau. And uh, then they said, well, you want to select some pictures? I guess they thought that if I talked about the paintings or wrote something about them, people could look at them in another way. And I guess when people are the custodian of, um, of work like that, they think of new ways to present it, get people to be interested. And I thought they probably thought that was a convenient thing to do, but at the same time, it was a great honor. And they were extremely, I mean, at first, they said, well, no, you can't have self-portrait. Uh, we never lend that, or it's going somewhere. Uh, this painting, can't go out of this room and so listen, why don't you not ask me to do it? Because if I can't just pick the paintings that you're going to let me use, it's not really my point of view. But if you can give me uh, Monet's painting of the turkeys, and if you can give me this one or that one or that Manet painting of Eventai, then, uh, and they gave me all the paintings I selected except one Cezanne painting that couldn't be moved because it had been painted, it was a fresco and I had been taken from the fresco, and, and so uh, um, it was in a frame, and they couldn't move that. But we also rebuilt the walls there. Louise, who is the editor of the movie, uh, and wrote the script with Jean-Claude, and I built the walls. I mean, that's what she does. She's an architectural um, designer, interior designer. So I have an exhibition in, uh, in uh, Arus, in Denmark now, of 40 paintings that are, I mean, more or less the size of this, uh, these columns. Some of them are bigger than that, and so she built this space that's bigger than the Guggenheim there. So then coming to the movie where, um, I guess she thinks spatially, and I mean, I know that she does, and, and so as we were assembling the movie, we started to, uh, uh, we got done shooting on December 10th, and Juliet Welfling, who edited The Diving Bell, with me was not free until April. So we started to assemble the movie and thinking, you know, I mean, we just were too excited. And she put the AVID program on her laptop. We were editing the movie in airplanes in Mexico, in Costa Rica, wherever we went. By the time we got to Paris on February 24th, we were so far gone in order to, it was going to be a totally different movie if Juliet did it. We edited the movie ourselves.
for better or worse. Uh, but I'm very proud of the editing of the movie. I think it's a big part of the... I mean, you can't really separate the form from the content of this film. I mean, there are things that are said, but there are also equivalences where there's no speaking, there's just music, or there's just it's a silent movie. Uh, and then there's a lot of talking, so there's a kind of... Uh, there are a lot of questions about balance, about uh, how to tell a story, I mean, the way the lack functions in the film. So I think probably this film is the most... You know, I think every time you make a movie, first of all, probably whatever you... I was talking with Guillermo del Toro yesterday, who was a huge fan of the movie, and very, very um, verbal, and he's so smart. And But he said, you know, we all make one movie in our lives, basically, and they're all in different panels, which is true. Uh, and it's a body of work. And I probably couldn't have made this film before. Uh, I know that I couldn't have, and I wouldn't have. And so from Basquiat, which I thought, I didn't try to reinvent the wheel when I did that. It just mm -hmm. knew Jean-Michel, tried to tell the story. I was a participant, a witness to a lot of those events. But after making six films, I guess I got more familiar with the materials, and after making The Diving Bell, you just start to think of how you want to tell a story. And I think I like to tell a story in the first person. So you feel like you are Vincent van Gogh. It's not really about him. It's about being. And it's not really just about Vincent van Gogh. It's about anybody that ever wanted to make anything. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't stop because somebody, all art is something that is made by one artist and like a note is handed to the next one. People that aren't born, or people that, kids that will go see something, get a spark somehow. I mean, and then, it continues, and the objects are there, and they have a discourse with each other. I mean, there's a dialogue between the dead artist and the live artist, but the art is alive. So sometimes the, the pain, film is, pain uh, is you, isn't it? Hey man, there's Doing other the people pain. on this table. Okay, sorry. Okay, <laughs> I'm sorry, but yeah, okay. the film is about a process, as you're saying, and we really get to see Van Gogh's process through the work, and we also get to see his frustration with the commerce, which is also true of Basquiat. Is that something that you attach to? Um, well, I think that the, uh, maybe that's a consistent uh, problem that artists have. I mean, there's always a chasm between the artist and the art, and there's an incongruity between your life and the life of the, of the work that you make. And there's definitely a chasm between society and the artist. I think that in... Um, uh, Jean-Michel's case, it was very, very different, or in my case, it's very different than in Van Gogh's situation. And, um, you know, you have to think that Van Gogh was supported by his brother. He, he wasn't poor. He, ha he didn't have a lot of money, but he had enough money to buy paint and to eat. And there's a lot of other artists. I mean, I, I worked as a cook, cab driver, did a lot of different things. I mean, um, my parents didn't pay for me to uh, live while I painted. So, I mean, I think Van Gogh got the paint, uh, and, um, and at first, I mean, he says in the film, he said, you know, when he's talking to the, Dr. Gaget, he says, I thought an artist was supposed to teach people show, how, how, to, how to live. But I don't think that anymore. Now I just think about my relationship with eternity. What do you mean by that? And um, so, um, when you're young, you want agreement. You expect it. You look for that. I think as you get older and you make art, you just have the covenant with that thing that you're making. And you don't expect people to, um, you don't care if they like it or they don't. I mean, you know, I'll get a good review for this movie. Somebody will really love it. How does it affect you really? What are you going to do? You still have to wake up every morning. You're going to die at, you know, at some moment, and whether you get sick or not. But it's a, you're here for a bit. and. Uh, so what are you going to do with your life when you're here? I think he did exactly what he wanted to do. I think he painted the paintings he wanted to paint. I mean, he made 75 paintings in 80 days in auvers sur -Wasse. That doesn't seem to me like a guy that wants to kill himself would do that. So, um, and I think it was extremely convenient to sort of sell this notion that he's a crazy artist, commits suicide, and everybody thinks, oh, they can't, because you know, why are people so compelled when they see Andy Wall's painting of suicide where a guy's jumping out of a building? Obviously, everybody's got something invested in it because we're all going to die, and it's somehow we have to come to grips with that. So, uh, a lot of these myth, the mythology around him, 
uh, and him being crazy or whatever is pretty, it's a cliche. Mm -hmm. And so I think one of the, um, uh, I don't want to get away, what was your question at the beginning? It was this? about the commerce and whether you Yeah, exactly. That. So, um, I mean, the fact is he traded paintings with different people. Uh, or that letter that he receives from Gauguin, is a real letter where Gauguin says, I saw your paintings at the Independent Show, I'd like to trade one. That was a, probably the best review he ever got. And also uh, the idea of, um, it's so funny, I mean, but his relationship to commerce obviously is a fascinating thing because at the end when he dies and his coffin is put in the cafe, that's ha that happened. And so they put all of his paintings around. I mean, there's a letter that he wrote saying, I, I'd like to have a show in a cafe. Uh, and so they put his paintings in the cafe and a lot of people took them uh, like party favors. And that's why there's so many paintings in private collections. People just walked off with them. And uh, the man who was running the Van Gogh house, uh, the, 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 who owns the Ravo Inn, told me this story before I said to him, I don't think he killed himself. And then he kind of was not that happy. Uh, that that was a possibility, but he told me the story, and I thought, okay, we'll do that and rebuild the Rabo Inn in Chambly, and because he also didn't like the idea that we suggested that uh, the drawings were real, which the Van Gogh Museum has not authenticated, but um, I saw them; they looked pretty real to me, and it's irrelevant. I mean, as a story in a movie, it's a beautiful uh, through line, and then at the end, everybody usually take some kind of a gasp when they see that they discover the drawings 126 years later. Um, so it also gives you an opportunity for him to walk through the landscape and it shows his perspective on things, which he was very, he was on the far edge of society. So also when she asks a question or something, I try to answer all questions. So anybody can always interrupt me when they want and I will just, it's just one monologue that I'm going to have and I can vary from the left to the right or around. You, you said that you wanted to put us in the mind of Van Gogh. Uh, how did you work uh, on the cinematography with Ben Wadiwa? Uh, did you add uh, references in the Van Gogh paintings or something? Because it's really, just really interesting. Uh, well, I didn't do it like a try. I, I think that Vincent Minnelli tried to emulate the paintings. They tried to make everything look like the paintings. I think the 19th century was a very grimy time. And it was quite dirty. And, so I think when he was in society, or he was in Le Tamborin, or he was in the Hotel de la Gare, it's pretty crummy in there, and it's kind of brownish and greenish and grayish, and almost uh, monochrome in a sense. And then when he gets outside, the light is just like that there. You go there, I mean, you know, when Albrecht Dürer was in his uh, studio, the guild sent somebody up to say, how, do you, how did you paint that, your self-portrait? How did you paint the hair in your self-portrait? And he pulled out a brush and had one hair on it. So, there, there's a, I think he probably had two hairs, because you need to have one, <laughs> one hair where the other hair can lean on it as it will hold the paint. <laughs> but um, you just go out there and the light is like that. The wind is like that. And so we shot nature. And, um, when, you, when I walk around, I, I look at my feet. I don't know, I mean, if you're walking a long distance, you probably, you don't, looking around always like that, you kind of look down. I thought, wouldn't it be great to see feet walking up the screen? And so I sent Benoit to um, Scotland because there was no wheat fields left in, um, in Arles at that time of year, because we were there in September. So he went to, we, he went, and I asked him to wear Van Gogh's pants, shoes, and clothes, even a hat in case there was a, a, a camera shadow, and photograph his feet. And so we have six hours of Benoit photographing his feet <laughs> and through reeds, through high grass, through other, and, and so I thought it was an interesting way to tell about time if he, and the seasons, if he just walks through the terrain and the terrain changes as he's walking through it. And then finally it goes from February to the summer in a, in a couple of steps. But um, uh, I think that Van, um, Van Gogh, there you go. It's Van Gogh, Benoit, Willem, and I were all kind of the same person. And sometimes I would give the camera to Willem. I walked out of a, 
um, vintage shop, I bought some sunglasses. I didn't know that they were bifocals when I bought them. When I walked outside, I looked at the grass and there was a step in it. I thought, oh no, that was good. And I sent the glasses to Benoit and asked him to put them on the lens when we shot uh, some things. And he, the glasses were a little bit small for the lens, so he made a split diopter so we could have two different depth of fields. Because I wanted you to feel when Van Gogh was looking at something was different than when other people were looking or if it was an objective plan. So there's subjectivity and objectivity if that even exists. And then, um, instead of fixing the, um, the diopter to the lens, we kept it loose sometimes so it could be more fluid and so there wouldn't just be a line in front of it. He could move it around, like for example, when Oscar is leaving. And it feels like also uh, Van Gogh is getting more upset or even crying, more exacerbated. And, uh, and then there's other moments where he looks at the landscape and it's more still and the landscape's just kind of a blur at the bottom. It's about seeing. I think the movie is about seeing also. And if you ask Will in the talk to him, he would say that he saw the world differently now. Because as I was teaching him how to paint, I, he would say, I, 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 I mean, I've heard what he had to say about it since. And he, I'd say, okay, draw that tree. And he'd start to draw a preconception of whatever the outside shape of the tree is, a uh, cypress tree in this case. So don't look at it like that. Just try to paint the light in. Paint the brightest marks that you see. Just paint the bright marks. And I said, okay, now paint, uh, uh, there's some shadows there. So wherever you see dark spots, paint the dark spots. And after a while, with this accumulation of marks, he had a tree. And he started to see things according to where the light hits things. And, um, and so uh, by the time he got to paint the shoes, he was pretty practiced in looking at things that way, and he's painting the shoes. And, and you asked me about that earlier. I mean, I'm painting sometimes. I mean, I kind of, um, in fact, when there's, he's looking at his rocks and he's drawing, my hand is in his shirt and his hand is holding the book. <laughs> so we were wearing the same shirt and uh, he was the same person, I guess. <laughs> I'm um, sorry. Uh, uh, just uh, to yeah. aware you, last what? question because we have to finish in five Just minutes. one question or two questions? Well, can we Let's just have one each? Two, we have one each. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. So just they haven't said anything. Mm -hmm. That's okay. They can wait for two minutes. Okay. Yeah. I'll have two questions. Okay. Thank you. So um, <laughs> please speak at the same time. Could you um, tell us something about your idea about the relationship with Van Gogh and religion and if you got some references? from Carl Theodor Dreyer, John Dark, with the, this really strict response. Well, first of all, uh, that painting of Marat Saad is a really great thing. Uh, uh, this is a great painting of him, but also, obviously, Artaud plays Marat Saad in, uh, in uh, Dreyer's movie. Um, wasn't, um, wasn't thinking about that, but maybe that's part of something that I always think about because it's such a great image. But uh, was not thinking about that uh, at that particular moment because I guess uh, Niels Aristrup was doing all the talking when he's in that bathtub. I and mean, he's extraordinary with all the tattoos on his face. But um, uh, religion. Uh, I was talking with Jean-Claude Carrier about uh, Christ and uh, we were having this conversation. He said to me, you know, everybody, you know, if you read the Gospels, no one knew who Christ was when he was alive until 30 or 40 years after he died. And I thought, well, that's dialogue. What a great thing to tell a priest who is supposed to be letting you out of the asylum, that the guy that he believes in, nobody even knew who he was when he was alive. So what are you all on about? You know? And I thought that was a great opportunity. I mean, we talked about it. Because obviously Van Gogh was very, he identified with Christ and he, was extremely, um, uh, if you read the letters, I mean, and, and when he says, uh, he said, turn uh, to the invisible. I mean, these are quotes out of Van Gogh's writing also. And so um, uh, I think we found different opportunities. I mean, the war in Indochina was going on at that time. So um, we thought, wouldn't it be great for Van Gogh to talk about Vietnam you know, or Shakespeare, who was obviously uh, uh, he read Shakespeare in English, and so I thought that was a great thing to... I mean, I think our approach to this movie was if you have 15 paintings in a show, and each painting is a vignette, and there's a story that went with each of these things, accumulatively you get a feeling when you walk out that you saw 
somebody's uh, a readout or on who, who that person was. And, uh, so whether it happened or it didn't, we invented these things that um, constructed together made this tapestry. Yes. Sarah, from the upcoming, um, Willem Dafoe is such an accomplished actor. What do you think it is about him that makes him so powerful on screen? And, and how did you work with him to bring out such nuance in this role? Well, I didn't realize he made 100 films. But I've known him for 30 years. And he has done theater, very physical theater, avant-garde theater in New York. He's worked in big movies, small movies. I mean, he is a yogi. I mean, he can tie, tie himself into a pretzel. I mean, he is also one of the most generous and gentle people you've ever met in your life. And I think this film gave him an opportunity to show this prismatic, uh, uh, he's like a rinpoche, you know, he can kind of, I mean, Gary Oldman can do that. Willem can do that. I mean, there are very few actors that are really, I mean, that, 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 that they are, there's this otherworldly thing about them. And I think that for me, as his friend, I thought if I didn't, ask him to play this role, I would not be a good friend and I would um, be robbing him of something he needed in his life. And I think I would have been robbing myself of the privilege of having him do something so extraordinary. I think his role is, I can't imagine another performance by anybody else this year or in the next 10 years that is uh, anywhere near what he's doing. That doesn't mean that he's going to get an award. I mean, the, the, these, this whole award thing is, is, is so... Um, shameful in a way and the audience is you know you can either try to placate the audience I mean somebody once asked me if you were going to make your movie for a big audience what would, what, what would you change I said I wouldn't change your fucking frame <laughs> <laughs> so I think he did a great job and so did all the other actors but he's amazing we had some great actors I mean Oscar and Matthew Almerich and, and Maz and Emmanuel, I mean, everybody that was there, we, we all know each other well and love each other, and it, there's not a lot of self-hate in this movie, a lot of trust. How did you assemble them all together, because they're all very dull working actors or anything like that? I, I know them all, and I, the, they're the first person, uh, people I asked for the roles, and they said yes. <laughs>